Greetings, comrades. We have an institution called KGB Scientific Research Committee here in Latvia. Those folks, being scientists of various qualifications, historians, philosophers, lawyers, uh, we have some medics there, even uh, forensics, all these guys are a committee of PhD people who do serious study of the Soviet history, focusing obviously on the actions of the nice men from the KGB. And the good news is that I've made contact with these people and have required a whole bunch of their written uh, scientific papers, which I'll be using for their show, and I've used their papers before, both in my Everyday Life episode and also specifically on the Intourist one. And now, their very their their most recent one, which they have just literally published a week ago, uh, is one which I think would be an interesting listen to you guys, before we go back to Stalin. Oh yeah, and uh, I also did interviews with uh, Russian and Ukrainian journalists, and that will also be an episode this month later on, because I had great conversations with these guys, and I want to talk about how these people see this uh, this whole region that we live in, and why why some Russian journalists would choose to actually move all of their uh, newsroom and like their their editorial and everything to Latvia, which they're living in now, uh, Medusa IO. That's going to be later on. But yeah, today the latest paper used here with the the, the kind of the permission of this KGB scientific research committee. Uh, and kind of their joy that's being spread around actually used is one about smuggling and about how the contraband networks worked in the Soviet Union and how the KGB fought with them. The paper by Aldis Daugavanax looks at specific criminal cases about smuggling with which some system can be seen in the period from 1945 to 1985. These cases were acquired in the KGB archives, because over here we still haven't uncovered and scientifically looked at at even half of the paperwork the massive organization left behind. These typical cases show the differences in seemingly similar economical crimes and the means and the attitude towards them by the KGB. As in, it was what was considered to be an extremely serious crime and what was less so, and how the jurisdictional system as a whole influenced this black market smuggling that was going on. Because you see, repressions and control over literally every aspect of life was the main instrument of the USSR to ensure their occupation power in the various territories that they annexed or puppeted during and after World War II. Uh, that was what they, what they did there. The economical basis, according to the Soviet ideologues, was also the thing that determined the rights of the people. In the Soviet jurisdictional system, rights were considered as a weapon to be used by the ruling class, this time the proletariat, in reality the nomenclature and the party upper-ups, to enforce their policies. Thus, the role of the criminal rights within this system was to defend the Soviet system as a whole and had nothing to do with it, to do with the people. It was to defend its economy against criminal threats. The economical crimes in the Soviet Union uh, kind of must be looked at through the lens of its ideology, as similar crimes in different systems of rights can be judged very, very differently. This can be best seen with the fact that such Soviet economical crimes like smuggling and speculation with foreign currency were considered to be state crimes. As you know, Soviet Union was, in a way, a federal state, albeit with an extremely powerful central government, with many republics and their governments doing whatever Moscow said, in fear of repressions from the center. But not everything was decided there, so for example, pity thievery was not a state crime, it was a local matter. And as long as the courts followed the Moscow doctrine, the Moscow itself didn't mess around in such pity cases. Not so with smuggling and speculating, because business is bad, and messing around with foreign stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. Those things are really serious business. In many ways, in more ways than one, yeah. Basically, the Soviets thought that if you smuggled something or had illegal foreign currency and speculated with it, then it was the crime against the very existence of the Soviet state, something just below treason or spying for filthy Western capitalists. 
In comparison, in most modern countries, such crimes would be considered crimes against the economy, and sure, they would be punished, well, except for speculation, which is the basis of capitalistic system, but, you know, when, the, when it comes to smuggling. But it's not like you'd be treated as a traitor or, or anything like that. And, because of the severity of these crimes, they fell under the jurisdiction of the KGB, acting kind of like uh, FBI here, and not the common state police or milizia, as it was called back then. Interestingly enough, that the responsibility for solving these crimes fell under the counterintelligence sections of the KGB, because you could never be sure if the person smuggling in jeans isn't actually selling terrible foul secrets to the Americans. Each of these investigative departments of the counterintelligence institutions had a special prosecutor assigned to them, which would then take personal responsibility over those cases. And we all by now should know what personal responsibility means. Another interesting thing about this was that in such cases, the first court instance was also the final one. Soviet speculators and smugglers had no rights of appeal. They would go to gulags, colonies, prisons of various severity, and that's that. Very more often than not, with confiscation of property, of course. But now, let's move on to the cases themselves, uncovered from the secret archives by the Committee of uh, Scientific Research of the KGB, which I have gladly translated into English for all of you, as with the whole of this uh, scientific paper, except I cut out, <laughs> cut out a bunch of, you know, the more cold parts. As, as this, uh, the cases themselves, I think, is the interesting part. Now, I won't be giving you these cases in full, because they are essentially KGB paperwork, with all the official jurisdictional language as they're presented in this document that I just translated. Because the author, Daugov Vanax, yeah, he's an attorney. So, he presents these cases as written. Like, as you would see the protocols of the KGB documents. And includes extremely, extremely dry commentary written in lawyer language. Thankfully, I'm fluent not only in English, but also in lawyer, so I will be telling you the good parts, and uh, translating all of this stuff into human. The first criminal case has the number 29353, and it's about some weird things in the 50s, it's still Stalin's era. So, in the 30th of March 1950, an arrest warrant was given for one Boris Yosifovich Ebenstein, for smuggling and speculation. It was based on the operative information that this Boris, from January to March 1950, smuggled in from Lvov, Ukrainian SSR, to Riga, Latvian SSR, 75 Swiss-made women's gold watches horn, which he then had either sold or traded for foreign currency and gold coins. The Soviet rubles, acquired in this way, was, uh, were also used to purchase foreign currency from various private persons. He had created his own smuggling ring with multiple collaborators even. What is interesting here is that although the watches were produced in Switzerland, technically, technically, all this man did was acquire them in Lvov, which was USSR, and bring them internally to Riga, which was also USSR. So, you know, although this is definitely speculation, it's not really smuggling even under Soviet criminal law and their papers. But hey, whoever cared about that anyways, especially since the Stalin's constitution technically was very liberal and uh, technically there were ways how the republics could leave the Soviet Union and the people had a lot of guaranteed rights and everything else in, in the very proper nice way, but whoever cared about such meaningless pieces of papers as constitutions anyways, really. Boris Ebenstein got a proper accusation in the 30th of August, 1950. He was accused of, and I will quote directly, <clears throat> not working a proper job, useful for the society, but instead is committing illegal contraband of valuable gold watches and for illegally purchasing foreign currency and gold coins. Because unlike you fancy pants evil capitalists, we in the Soviet Union know that being a businessman is not valuable whatsoever, and is just a way to exploit the working man. And good working men and women don't need any foul, terrible Swiss watches anyways. Who needs gold Swiss watches? They're useless. His collaborators were accused for <clears throat> having criminal ties with the smuggler, not reporting the prosecutor to the authorities, and other associated crimes, end quote other associated crimes. 
One of them also got accused specifically for <clears throat> speculating with fur coats as an extra. In the accusation papers, the recommended punishments are 10 years in Gulag for Boris Ebenstein and 8 years for his associates. With confiscation of property and valuables, of course. This document was then sent to Moscow, where, in a closed court, without the presence of the accused, it was looked at in a special court about a month later. What, 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 do you want some, some jury? Defenders? Presence of the accused in the courtroom with the right to defend themselves? Wait, 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 what? Are you trying to defend people who double in gold watches and fur coats? Preposterous. Now, obviously, the court itself was very efficient, and, most importantly, short. Everyone accused got exactly the recommended punishments, and I presume that the judges then had a sandwich in the dining room, probably with some coffee, while, you know, discussing how their wives will now be very happy about their brand new shiny horn women's gold watches. Ebenstein was sent to Kargopola camp in Arkhangelsk, and we don't sadly have any data about when or how he got released, if he did even eventually and didn't die there, but we do know that at least some of his collaborators, uh, sent on various other camps around the Great Motherland, got released after Stalin's death in the rehabilitation period. Uh, specifically, the guy who smuggled in fur coats as a side business to one <clears throat> Streicher, who was sent to Marinsk in Kemerov Oblast. Yeah, he was released in April 21st, 1953, just a month and a half after Stalin's death, which meant that he spent basically just about two years in very, very far away Siberian lands. This shows how the crimes of this sort were dealt with during the Stalinist era, but let's move on into the future a bit now, shall we? This podcast is fully supported and fully funded by our patrons. Here are our latest supporters. John, Dane, Andy, Tommy, Howard, Jason, William, Curtis, Theodore, Baked and Awake, Emma Deus, and Brian. Thank you all very much. We'd like to remind you, all our patrons and listeners who would like to become our patrons, is that our Patreon is per episode, not per month. Many people have canceled their patronship because they thought that they were donating for a month and then they got ripped off. But we're not trying to rob you. We want to remind you again that our Patreon is per episode. Also, after our illness, we're back on track, and we've resumed all the special patron things that we promised earlier, so please don't worry. Starting December, Patreon's changing their fee system, so to all our patrons, we've sent you all an email about it and how it works, so you can see for yourselves. As per theme of this episode, we have the Eastern Border-themed card game, made by our listener, John Vaughn, called Contrabanda about smuggling enough stuff while avoiding the KGB to defect to the West, which you can buy. Links are on the show description. Besides, Christmas is coming, and on our page, theeasternborder.lv, you can find a link on the right side there to buy our t-shirts and commie tears mugs, because they definitely make great Christmas gifts for your decadent capitalist friends. Remember to follow us on Twitter, at eastern underscore border, on Facebook, the Eastern Border, our webpage, where you can find all our episodes and download them for free at theeasternborder.lv or just send us an email with your questions, ideas, recommendations, whatever you'd like to send us. Thank you all. Have a happy Sunday. And now, back to the show. Our second criminal case is numbered in the KGB documents as 45123. This criminal case starts out weird and gets better as it goes on. And this was also the funniest one of the whole thing, I presume. It was started when the lieutenant colonel... There is no R's in this word. There are no R's there. 
Ugh, sometimes I hate English. Anyway, Lieutenant Colonel of the KGB Bureau, one Jan Skirsteins, started a criminal process against Theodor's Ausseis in the 25th of January 1966. That's, that's Khrushchev said already. Uh, this case was started for illegal ownership of a Mauser system pistol. In the investigation, the KGB found out that Ausseis had taken the pistol from one Luxis Karasiris, because someone else, other involved person, Valentin Klukins, had wanted to purchase it. When Comrade Ausseis had delivered the pistol to Klukins, uh, the Klukins had refused to make the deal. Now, about a week later, in the 21st of January 1966, the nice folks in the upper KGB echelons made a decision to take over the case, because it could be included in their own smuggling case where this Ausseis was also involved, together with his friend Ivar Straume. Turns out that they had purchased, in a commissioned second-hand store, a painting, View on Venice, by Ludolf Liebertz for 120 rubles, and also his painting, Garden, for 43 rubles. 120 rubles, again, let me remind you, is the average salary of an engineer at the time. Before I continue, Ludolf Liebertz was a Latvian painter who lived and worked in interwar Latvia, then he emigrated during World War II, briefly living in Austria, and then moving to the United States in 1950, where he worked in New York City College, teaching painting. He also died there in New York in 1959. He is considered to be one of our classical painters, and a part of Latvian cultural canon. And he's quite an important person in Latvian art in general, and his paintings are obviously very valuable now. So, he's kind of a bigwig guy here, if it comes to the art world. So, our criminal heroes had purchased two of his paintings, and in Riga trade port, circumventing the official customs, gave them to a captain of a Finnish ship, so that he would bring them to Sweden, to be given to the father of Straume's classmate, Ernest Zvanax. And now a side tangent, because the KGB collected all these things, because of the Latvian emigre newspaper likes or the time, we even have some information of this Ernest Svanax. Apparently, he was a teacher who lived in Lund, Sweden. He had some children left in the Latvian SSR, which he had went to visit in June 1959. One other fun thing that the KGB kind of found out is that he had won the third prize in the 1962 contest by the Latvian SSR KGB cover newspaper Zimtanis Bals. That was the KGB cover newspaper, which was in Latvian, and it was printed uh, kind of and sent around the world. It was the uh, emigre newspaper, which was printed and organized by the KGB to check out the moods, maybe get some of them back to return, you know, then torture them for secrets, stuff like that. Zimtanis Bals literally means the voice of fatherland. Uh, in the 16th of July, 1962, they have uh, published the results of the contest Did You Know? That's the name of the contest. Where apparently 197 various emigre Latvians from 10 different countries in total had participated. And they had to answer various questions, 15 in total, which were all connected with the knowledge about the Latvian SSR. Like, <clears throat> which important Latvian linguist has received the Lenin's award? And which orchestra is being led by the director Leon Sreiters? And what and how many professional theaters do you know in Soviet Latvia? You know, stuff like that, mostly cultural things. So yeah, and our smuggling criminal mastermind, Teacher Vanax from Lund, Sweden, scored third place there. And, you know, he got a book about modern Soviet art as a result. Yay! But I presume he actually knew some things about art, because he obviously must have known that this paintings by Liberts even though they cost a lot of money in the Soviet Union, yeah, I uh, I sincerely think that he knew the actual cost of these things. What he did then was um, quite crazy, because for this deed of sending these paintings to Vanax, which are today uh, extremely expensive, and also back then they already were way more expensive than what they were just sold for in this commission store, because obviously the people working in the commission store probably didn't know anything about art, our comrades, in return, had received a mail package from Vanax. And now, this is important, listen carefully. In this package, they received <clears throat> a nylon blanket, two nylon raincoats, and one woman's slip, the, the undergarment thing. 
It's called Kombiné in Latvian, and thankfully Alice was there to explain this to me. Anyhow, they, these uh, brave criminal masterminds, uh, sold these valuable goods to the same commission second-hand store, and, you know, got some profits off of this. Now, besides the investigation, um, I do have to say that our heroes, Ausais and Straume, were royally screwed even before KGB showed interest for them. Like, totally and completely swindled. I mean, trading Latvian art classics, literally very important art pieces of Latvian culture, for three pieces of clothing and one nylon blanket. I'm not even sure if this is, like, funny, actually, and whether or not they had any idea about how much the art pieces were worth in the real world. Or should I maybe be sad about the poverty here, with all the deficits, that you can actually make a profit by buying art and selling those received nylon cloth pieces? Well, that's kind of creepy, but one thing is for sure, Mr. Vanax from Lund, Sweden, I... Gotta applaud you, you managed to swindle some smugglers out of a large sum of money. Because obviously, Mr. Vanax got the better end of the deal by far. But this case wasn't the only occasion when our dynamic duo, Straum and Ausseis, attempted their hand uh, in small-time business. Even though I seriously doubt their actual competence in the business part. These guys had also, in multiple occasions, bought nylon raincoats from sailors of the ship Horn Baltic. It was a West German cargo ship, and quite famous at that, as it was also used in a propaganda piece in the newspaper Zinja, where in the article Where the Ships of the World Meet, in 10th of January 1963, the <clears throat> swift servicing of this very sad said ship is being used as propaganda to tell how efficient and amazing the work in rig trading port is. Yeah, so, uh, nylon raincoats from deckhands? A deficit in the Soviet Union. Our heroes then, with the help of various other involved persons, because right now they've, like, involved a bunch of other people who all just buy and sell nylon rain raincoats from these guys there. Yeah, they sold them out to the public for profit. One of the involved people here in this raincoat business was one Askold Meterinch. This guy, uh, as we have information on him, is important, because he explains with what kind of folks, who just literally can't stay out of trouble or be subtle or sneaky whatsoever, are brave to smuggling masterminds Straum and Ausseis were dealing with. And this gets just even crazier and sillier than before. See, this uh, Meterinch involved in this evil criminal nylon raincoat case, uh, according to this KGB case, is also mentioned in the article of Soviet Youth, 16th of November 1954, where it was written about his unacceptable actions, drinking and hooliganism, especially since he was in the, in the, a student in the Latvian State University, a second-year chemistry, and a member of the communist youth movement at the time. His unacceptable actions were that he, during his summer internship practice in Kolhoz, and I don't know, he might have gone there to actually do some chemist work for them, or it just might have been the regular, hey, uh, this is this is summertime, you go help out in Kolhoz, students or something. I can't really tell here. But anyway, he had organized brewing of beer there. Yeah, he had then drank said beer with his comrades, and then he had apparently broken a window of some Kohos member, as written in the case, by throwing an apple at it. Yeah, so you know, the reliable sort. By the way, he got scot-free from this case, but uh, Meterinch got into his own trouble next year, 1967, when in the 18th of August, the same Soviet youth again wrote about our chemist, who had by then graduated from the Faculty of Chemistry, and who, with the help of his pal, Andris Jonatans, who apparently only had 7th grade education, firstly, these guys had speculated by buying cheap apples from Kolhos, and then selling them in the market in St. Petersburg in 1963, and then, later, with the help of some other people, committed thievery as well. 
The article says that Metterich and his cohorts on the 8th of August 1967 were all declared guilty, and Metterich had received 12 years in prison. The article also, funnily enough, mentions that the Jonathans, and I don't know why this is important, loved to wear nylon shirts, and although oh, completely uneducated, was apparently a natural talent when it came to fixing cars, and thus sometimes was even too allowed to drive Metterich Volga. So yeah, these these great people are the squad mates of Straume and Auseis, uh, are not so very competent criminal guys. No, seriously, I still can't stop thinking about how much that teacher living in Sweden profited from these uh, totally competent criminal masterminds. Just wow, man. Anyhow, this sale of German nylon raincoats bought from the sailors was classified by the KGB investigators as smuggling in an organized group. I wonder what the name of their like organization was in the papers. The Nylon Mafia? The Great Raincoat Syndicate? <laughs> Jokes aside, by the way, this is more serious than it seems, because we have some numbers too. In total, Ivar Straume alone had sold 90 of these smuggled raincoats, making a profit of no less than 20 rubles from each sale. Again, the average salary of an engineer, who's like not a common worker, an engineer is 120 rubles. Up to 200 rubles in rare cases. So this is a lot of money. And they, he had acquired 1800 rubles in total. That's a huge amount of money for 1966. And obviously the profits were split among the group. And Ausais had also participated and sold some other things. So this whole thing meshed up. And, you know, even though it's kind of funny to call our nylon mafia, uh, who like got swindled themselves because of the, the Swedish guy. Oh man, I can't really drop him out of my head here. But yeah, the profits that they made were ridiculously large and very serious at the time. The investigation papers, by the way, then declare that both Straume and Auseis, quote, did no useful work for the society, instead being speculating parasites. End quote. Yeah, again, I, I love the idea that, you know, everyone who's doing anything that would be considered small business today is considered a speculating parasite, but that's a whole, another whole can of worms there. Uh, listen to our criminal code episode. <clears throat> Even though, by the way, there are documents in the very same case that uh, state that Straume was also a professional translator and apparently had translated a lot of Czech literature in Latvian. He was very completely fluent in Czech and Polish and Russian and English. Like, Straume was apparently an intelligent man. In the end, Straume was sent to a strict regime labor camp. That's the official term for uh, gulags with confiscation of property. Andre Auseis received six years, but the court declared, declared not to confiscate his property, with the excuse of the, being the fact that uh, he had none. Literally, that's the papers. We can't confiscate his property because he doesn't have any. Which is weird. I don't know. How do you spend like all this Soviet money so fast? Now again. <laughs> jokes aside, again, this this case was a bit funny, you have to admit that, but we can see here that, uh, yeah, you could be accused of smuggling and judged accordingly, even though literally no one of the involved people had ever crossed the Soviet border and hadn't bought any, brought any illegal things inside the Soviet Union. All they did was literally purchase popular stuff that was an extreme deficit in the country at the time and then, you know, sold it for profit. Got swindled in the meantime too, but... But yeah, <laughs> selling something for profit, that is a horrendous crime in the Soviet economy. Because that economy needs its people to be completely reliant to the state for survival. Because if you can make it on your own, uh, why would you ever need the party then? Telling you how to live and what to do. But okay, these guys were kind of the, uh, the, the joke, Nylon Mafia. Our next and final case, later on again, are about some really serious smugglers this time. So, our third case is numbered in the papers as 4529832. As you can see, the case number just continue growing. This case is all about how in the 1st of August 1979, we're uh, in Andropov's period, on the motor ship Mechanik Gerasimov, and on the 12th October, also, 79, also 1979, on another motor ship, Stepan Halturin, KGB had found smuggled goods. Real smuggled goods this time. In the beginning, those were two separate cases for each ship, 
but in the 26th of February 1980, they were joined. This was a large case, a really large case by the, by the kind of looks at the time, investigated by multiple KGB subsections at the same time. They did it separately, of course, so that the higher-ups could compare and contrast information, ensuring the loyalty of the investigators themselves, because a lot of money was involved here, and the truthfulness of the information. Uh, this was a very popular tactic of, of the kind of these huge cases by the KGP at the time, so that, you know, they could ensure that the, each of the small groups investigating each case, you know, couldn't collaborate and work with the, with the accused. Well, okay, the guilty guys, uh, no one ever gets, uh, spoiler alert, no one ever gets, you know, acquitted of anything here. The accusation declared that the 19-year-old, non-working, as there was no official unemployment in the Soviet Union, uh, most likely he technically had a job somewhere, just didn't show up ever, or just never went there, or just run, ran from it. Well, anyways, this non-working Alexander Lovens had organized a criminal group in the June of 1979, together with a deckhand from the Mechanic Gerasimov ship, one Alexander Savin, to organize their smuggling activities. They were later joined by two other deckhands, one from each ship. In these smuggling cases, there are some curious nuances. Essentially, they show how often other random criminal cases against the accused in smuggling were often started and then just later ended because of various events. But, you know, the KGB tried to pin everything on you if you were a smuggler or, like, speculator. For example, those involved in this case also got accused, and, you know, these cases later dropped, for creating and spreading pornographic materials. Because during the search, they had found a single, one, one torn out page from a foreign magazine. I presume it was kind of, you know, they just bought some erotic magazines and, you know, took the middle page being, being deck hands on the ship there and just posted on their walls or something but that was pornography yeah just just one just that mid thing then they also got accused for infecting a woman with an with an std unspecified std mind you and for illegally moving one jacket and one coat over the borders of the soviet union the coat and jacket cases were ended because the accused had worn them out by this point and had thrown them out as well and they hadn't been preserved because they had been worn out and thrown out. So there was literally no evidence, so this case about the jacket had to be dropped. But here comes the very serious stuff, actually. According to this case, in the early July 1979, Comrade Lavens in Riga had purchased 12 uh, Orthodox icons valued at 1,500 rubles a lot of money, and 26 cans of caviar in Moscow, weighing 1.8 kilograms in total. Uh, That's, like, almost 4 pounds, with a value of 1,872 rubles. Dekhan Savin had established a special hiding place on the ship where the goods were held while transporting them. So, in July 1979, they smuggled them out from the Soviet Union on the Mechanic Gerasimov ship during a Riga-Amsterdam-Riga trip. He also involved three other members of the crew in this crime organization. Their task was to purchase goods in Antwerp and illegally bring them in the USSR, hiding them from the customs. So, and here comes a long list of things, you know, uh, which, what each member brought, but they just, you know, compiled them into, like, total amount of goods. So, in total, completely, they bought 246 pairs of jeans, one pair of velvet pants, uh, not purple, but specifically said not purple, two rock music cassettes, 172 women's jean dresses, and 5,000 polyethylene bags. You know, the big ones with advertisements and cool pictures on them, uh, like, you know, Mar- Marlboro or something from, like, popular TV series or whatever. You know, the, the very colorful ones, which which we used to have, you know, just random bags. These things were super valuable here in the Soviet Union, because people would, like, rewash them and use them as a status thing. And, uh, like, if you would go, like, in the early 90s, When I was a kid, I remember that uh, we went to, like, the market, because we have this huge farmer's market in Riga, and we went there, and there would be, like, huge stalls of, like, just selling these cool 
polyethylene bags back then in the market, like in the early 90s, because there were just so many of them that never really went away, but it, but like uh, they were really rare in Soviet era, because you know everyone everyone just used some some uh, cloth bags or something. So if you got this one cool painted polyethylene bag, yeah, that was considered to be something something cool and valuable here. So in total, these guys on both of the ships thus smuggled in stuff that was totally uh, in total valued for. Okay, uh, and this is crazy. <clears throat> 43,430 rubles. These guys, unlike in the previous case of uh, Nylon Mafia, are not joking around. They're like very serious, because this is just ludicrous. Further on, in September 1979, Comrade Lavent also gave 3,550 United States dollars, like foreign currency, to be illegally smuggled out from the USSR. By the way, the value of those late 70s dollars, as stated in the case files of KGB, is valued to be 2,284 rubles. Which is kind of crazy, because this presumes that ruble was way more valuable than a dollar. Obviously, it was uh, way less than what their actual real value of the ruble, which was an extremely soft currency, what the real value actually was. The case also states that these guys had decided to further expand their smuggling operation to get antiques and valuable artistic objects out of the country, including paintings, icons, precious metals, jewelry, and the like. They had planned to hide all the illegal goods in their pants and shoes and in their cabins. Those valuables were found during the surprise KGB raid on both ships. This case, also, interestingly enough, uh, one of the more interesting... uh, kind of documents there that we have in this case, also reveals the duties that had to be done by the captain's first aid on any ship that traveled outside the USSR. So the first hand, Oyars Upmanis, of the mechanic Gerasimov ship, testifies in this case, quote, My duties include the political education of the crew and also solving the questions that are tied to the crew, going offshore in foreign countries. There is a public commission on the ship that checks how the members of the crew spend their foreign currency. Whenever they come back from the shore leave, they have to show the members of commission any goods that they have purchased while there. End quote. So yeah, this was like a total, complete control over whatever you could purchase and buy and how much money you even had there. But people still managed to smuggle just ridiculous amounts of goods in and out. In the end of this huge thing, many people were tried and convicted. From the organizers, specifically... Alexander Lavents got five years and six months in strict colony, but without exile. So this term would be served in Latvian SSR, most likely central prison. And his main comrade, Alexander Savin, got six years and six months in the same type of colony, also without exile. Obviously, with confiscation of property for both of them. We can see here how the punishments get more lax as this, unlike our second case, was a really huge and actually serious operation that they had running. In the Stalinist era, they would just probably get shot or just sent to gulags for life. But now? Well, 1979 was Andropov's time. Shooting wasn't... nice. Extremely long prison sentences weren't as economically viable because the Soviets had started to run out of money. And KGB had just starting to run out of efficiency in general. So such larger cases just became more and more popular, I suppose. These guys would just laugh at the Nalon Mafia, as so should you. In the end, there are some conclusions that can be made from these cases. Obviously, these all cases of smuggling and speculation, some of which wouldn't even be crimes today, were extra serious breaches of law in the Soviet Union. Reasons for smuggling can easily be found in the system of rights in the USSR and its economic system, where a total deficit, a complete lack of various goods, was the absolute norm. And if, in the earlier years, the motivation of those accused of smuggling can be tied to their understanding of basic rights and economy, like market economy, which was formed in the interwar independent Latvia before the Soviet occupation, you know, because people actually thought, hey, trading is good, business is good, that's what we always had, and these guys were just trying to smuggle things out because they, hey, they understood that, hey, we are supposed to have actual rights and we should be able to do this, Then, uh, later on, in the latter years, it's easy to see how this uh, new Soviet man propaganda and all the political education hogwash just 
simply loses out to basic economic realities. The newer cases also show how, by changing connections, the peoples involved in such crimes change with them. Private persons couldn't bring in foreign stuff and valuables through Soviet customs legally, like in principle, like at all. So various goods, even though they weren't removed from markets through official jurisdiction, were only available in extremely limited quantities through various black markets. As the time went on, more and more sailors got involved in this case. And not like the system didn't understand the risks. There was a whole program in place for extra hardcore propaganda and political education for these people, like like you heard, mostly done by captain's aides. And obviously smuggling was always there because that's how market works. If there is a demand, there will be a supply. There's always some speculation that comes with this. And as it just had to be done in a group to succeed, the authorities always pinned on organized crime laws, so we got our nylon mafia. And yeah, obviously the KGB didn't even care that you had never been out of the country. If you were speculating with foreign goods, you were tied to smuggling somehow, so extra smuggling charges were always put in too. Together with, well, other nonsense like pornography charges for a single page. Because then, well, then it would be just much harder to rehabilitate the involved persons. They would get harsher uh, harsher treatments and, you know, uh, if, if they could pin more crimes on you, then, you know, they would fill out their own quota. Because KGB also had their own quota of crimes of how many crimes and cases needed to be solved each year. So, you know, if they pin out more cases on you and more crimes, then they can fill their quota even faster. This whole thing kind of really honestly and splendidly represents a whole insanity of the Soviet world and Soviet mindset. Because, like, it's, it's not that you did a crime to be guilty of it. You just did things and risked things, and I have to applaud the people's bravery that they even attempted to do such smuggling things. But yeah, this, uh, this, this weird conclusion, the fact that, you know, people will smuggle in jeans and rock and roll no matter what, this will have to end this episode. So, um, yeah, thank you for listening, and, um, I did my best to translate and transform the very scientific paper of Mr. Daugav Vanax into a more understandable form, and hey, this is the first time when something like this is even done in English. But, yeah, I hope you like this. I uh, will be working with a lot more materials from the KGB Research Institute in the future which just just gave me a, a material for a huge amount of specials. And if in this case, uh, I really just couldn't find any people to be interviewed about the smuggling, because, you know, it wasn't such a large group, so I couldn't grab any personal interviews here in this episode, which I apologize for, then there will be, of course, some other papers, other scientific papers, which I'll go through and translate and work on. Uh, of course, we're looking at extra literature there, as I did in this time with the newspapers. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to get more interviews if I'll find something that, you know, I can ask real people about. Hope this will be interesting. Of course, uh, Stalin series are going to move on because we've finally moved on to the interesting bits of those. So, yeah, thank you for listening and uh, see you next time. And we will be back with Stalin. Then we'll have a Christmas episode and then we'll do uh, an interview with, like, uh, these Russian-Ukrainian journalists. I have things planned out, but we will see how will this turn out this December. Anyway, до свидания, товарищи. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.